Hey everyone, Greg here with Science Studio. Below me right here is a Sony PlayStation. There is no number after this model because, well, this was the first model that Sony ever released of the PlayStation series. This has been owned by my family for about 15 or 16 years. I might be completely wrong about that, but I remember having this thing when I was very, very young, and I used to play games on this all the time. This was the first console I ever played that I can remember, and... It served my childhood very well. So what we're going to do now, that it's basically been sitting in a box for a long time, is tear it down and we're going to see what was inside of this very old but very cool first gen Sony PlayStation. There's something in here that like rattles. I have no idea what that is, so maybe we'll find out when we actually start tearing it down. So the outside first off is where we'll start with the uh, teardown process. Obviously there's nothing on the top here that we can unscrew, but I do want to give you a quick uh, rundown of what it was like to own one of these things, and uh, basically the versatility of such a, uh, I don't know, I guess rather slim form factor. I mean, if you think about it for the time, even though the games that this console would run were not very intensive, you know, in today's standards, they actually were back then. And so to have a console so slim and so small uh, was quite impressive for its time. You can see here we have an open button. All this does here is pop open the uh, CD tray. This kind of reminds me of those old school CD players. You know, you lift the, the little flap and then insert your little CD ROM. And yeah, that's basically what that is. So you can see it's just mechanical. It's really all that happens there. So this lid kind of pops up. Just plastic. Uh, this is the power button. You would push this and it would turn on. And then uh, you'd push it again and it would turn off. It does seem to have like a little uh, spring loader in there. And then uh, a reset button, which I don't ever remember using, but I guess this would be a, this would be a useful tool if you ever had games freeze up on you, uh, which the PS1 was notorious for. So uh, that's it for the top, really. Um, pretty cool there. On the front here, you've got two memory card slots. These memory cards uh, were not very big at all. I believe that the largest that we ever owned was a 512 kilobyte uh, memory card. And uh, really, it's all you need. I mean, because all it's going to do is just load a save point from the game. So the CD would do much of the loading. The memory card would just tell the CD where to start from. And then you have these very ancient controller inputs. So original controllers did not have the, the joysticks, the little analogs on either side that you could play with, um, but these did support those and uh, were offered later on after the console was released. The sides here, nothing entertaining. Um, both sides were kind of the same. Let's see, nothing special. Dude, really? Yeah, you're welcome. On the back here, you'll see we have a parallel power out. Uh, nobody really used that. Uh, same with the serial power out. Nobody used that that I knew of. The main one here that you would use for display, well, it's really the only one you can use, is the AV Multi out. So this is what uh, you would plug from here into a TV. A cable would feed from this side to an end like this. So you would have your video, which was yellow, and then you would have your left and right audio inputs, which would be, well, I guess outputs, the red and white Wow, that's like really dirty. That's really nasty. Anyway, these are very old. Uh, the whole thing's very old. So uh, I'm not sure how disgusting this thing will look when we actually start tearing it down, but uh, that's what we're about to do. So uh, you know, this is all fresh. I've never actually done this before. For some reason, one of the screws is like very lifted. I don't know why. I never tried to take this thing apart earlier. But as far as I know of, well, this one is too. That's really weird. I don't know. We're gonna tear it down anyway. Okay, so first things first, we're going to pop off these screws here on the bottom of the console. Like I said, I don't know why these look like they've been removed already. They weren't screwed in properly. They were removed. I don't know why, uh, why that's the case. You have these nice little handy arrows here that are, I guess, pointing to the rather obvious screws. I don't really know why, why they would uh, even bother doing that. Okay, maybe I should have done this from the other side. One second. Okay, so this is basically just the entire top of the frame of the console, just comes right off. You can see the, uh, 
The levers here, how they work, it's kind of kind of cool, just spring loaded there. Power button was literally just a piece of plastic that pushed the button actually on the board up here. And then same with the reset button, just another plastic piece that would push a button literally on the board itself. This is an important piece to the console, obviously. This is what would rotate the CD, and this laser right here is what would read the CD. So I believe the maximum amount of data allowed on a PlayStation CD was 660 megabytes. So this laser was in charge of moving up and down as this disc rotated, and uh, as all that occurred, the laser was basically reading the data on the disc and sending it through this cable right here. I believe that this cable is just for the motor, so this is what's going to rotate the disc. Uh, there are four cables here, so two of them are going to be for power, one's going to be for uh, ground regulation, and the other one's probably going to be kind of like a PWM controller on like a, a standard computer. It would tell the motor how fast to turn. So that's what I'm assuming those four cables are for. We're going to go ahead and pull these apart. Cool things about these cables here, they just pop right off the board. So this is the entire reading unit of the original PlayStation. Nothing special really now, but for its time, it was state of the art. We're going to put that to the side. So just as a safety precaution, I know this thing has like literally not been turned on for, I would say, 10 years. Uh, I'm going to hold the power button down. I advise doing this with anything that you take apart that involves a power supply and or transformer. So uh, hold this down for about five or 10 seconds. This will let all of the power drain out of any of the large capacitors that might be on the circuit board that you'll be working with. So essentially, this entire board right here, it's completely independent of the, I guess you could call it motherboard, which is where the CPU and GPU are housed. This entire board was in charge of power regulations. So you can see on the back here, this is where power would run into your console from a wall. Uh, and then this entire board would be in charge of basically downgrading the power to its specified amounts. And then these five cables right here were in charge of delivering power from this board, ultimately from the wall, to the motherboard. So the CPU and the GPU, all of your controller units, your memory cards, uh, your lasers, and uh, your CD motor would all be powered from just these five little wires right here. That's pretty cool. You don't see that nowadays. This little cable I unplugged here is in charge of memory card power allocation, memory card data, reading, and uh, also your controller. So any controller feedback that you wanted sent to the console would have to run through this little flat cable here. And there are actually only, it looks like, 10 pins. So really for, for what you're inputting here, you know, downgrading that down to just 10 pins of, of a data stream is actually quite impressive. So we're gonna go ahead and see if we can lift this entire panel off now. I believe I've taken off all the screws. So this is just a big, I guess you could call it a, a heat shield. It's just a, a piece of metal. It's actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's some kind of aluminum, I'm assuming. And it just protects the entire motherboard. So what we have now are just pieces of copper. It's just a thin copper paper. And then over here, a, it's a more reflective metal. I'm also assuming that that is aluminum. It looks like aluminum, so... Uh, I don't know, maybe you guys know what that is, but uh, I think it's aluminum. It sure does look like aluminum. And this plate is actually, wow, it's actually soldered to the motherboard itself. This plate will not come up without using a, a soldering kit. Okay, so that just folds right up. That's, that's nice. This aluminum plate, like I said here, this is not going to fold up. This is soldered literally to the motherboard. Unfortunately, that's going to hide the CPU and the GPU in this case. So a lot of these fancy looking chips here are in charge of things like audio. They did have an independent audio processor on here. So similar to like a GPU or a CPU, they had something similar to like an SPU, so a sound processing unit. Um, and that would be what some of these chips are allocated specifically for. So a couple of cool facts about the central processing unit of the original PlayStation. 
this processing unit only had five kilobytes, that's right, that's with a K, not an M, five kilobytes of L1 cache. So most computers today utilize processors that have, I don't know, grades of L2 and L3 cache, but they're always typically in 512 kilobytes to one or two or three or four megabytes of uh, data allocation each. The CPU here carried 32-bit architecture and was running at a frequency of 33, roughly 33 megahertz. Uh, 33, yeah. If you're running like a 9590 right now by AMD, you're probably up at around 5 gigahertz. Uh, if you're running like a low-power Xeon E3, let's say, uh, you're probably running at 2.6 or 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, but most CPUs, whether they demand a lot of power or little, run at some gigahertz frequency. And uh, this one was only running at 33 megahertz. So this thing only had 2 megabytes of RAM to access. So that's basically the memory that the CPU would directly communicate with. Uh, and it only had 2 megabytes of it. So most computers nowadays would require at least uh, 2 gigabytes of RAM. I believe to run Windows 10 you need like 1.5 or 2 gigabytes of DDR2 or DDR whatever DDR you're running uh, but in this case this low power low frequency CPU only required 2 megabytes of just regular old DRAM. The GPU which Sony manufactured was also based on 32-bit architecture it only packed 1 megabyte of VRAM most graphics cards today require 2 gigabytes of VRAM that's gigabytes with a G it's a GB but in this case the GPU is only sporting one megabyte of VRAM. A lot of power. The GPU also had an adjustable frame buffer, flat shading, and texture mapping. These are words that you would still probably see in the specifications of graphics cards today. Now the video out over here was capable of displaying over 16 million colors on whatever screen you decided to plug this thing into, and also featured an interlaced 640 by 480 resolution. I don't advise doing this, by the way. I do not advise doing this on any new circuit board because you're going to like blow and then you're going to have some like spit fly out of your mouth and you're probably going to short circuit something. But in this case, should be okay. Um, even if something does happen, it's old. It's very old. Oh, hey, would you look at that? It actually works. I was not expecting it to, to be completely honest, uh, but I, st I still wanted to show show everyone what it would be like to have one not work. Um, the fact that it did is very impressive. Now, it did make some sounds. I don't know if you could hear them. I was just using my, my camera's built-in microphone, so the sound is probably not the greatest. But if you couldn't hear it, it was making some odd sounds. Um, when the console first started up, it would start spinning the disc and then it would make some loud, almost like grinding noises. Um, I think that has to do with the motor. There aren't any other moving parts in the system. There's no internal cooling fan or anything like that. 
So the only thing that I think could make that noise is the, the motor, and it might just be a bad motor in there. The audio was kind of a problem. Um, it, it would just be in and out, but uh, there wasn't any static or anything like that. So I'd say that the sound issue was probably just a, a driver issue, something that they're not going to update, obviously. Uh, but the fact that the game actually ran and was playable was quite cool. Um, and it was, it was nice to kind of jump back into the ring and play some old Frogger. Some old school Frogger. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So if you want to see more like this, let me know. I'll see what I can get my hands on and we'll do some more of these teardowns slash reviews slash spec overviews slash uh, test runs. See if we can get these systems to run like we did with this one here. So that's about it everyone. We appreciate you checking out our first ever console review slash teardown slash whatever. Thought the video was cool, give us a thumbs up. Thought the video was crap, give us a thumbs down. Be sure to subscribe. There's more than just this kind of stuff on our site. Be sure to check out our astronomy videos, our geology videos, especially our computer videos, which are, are pretty hot right now. We appreciate the support on all of those, and we will continue to bring more quality entertainment. From everyone here at Science Studio, thanks for learning with us. I'm gonna go play some more Frogger.